All right, welcome back to a very special episode of Dr. J Radio Live. Of course, I'm your host, Dr. J, broadcasting from the City of Angels. Or is it? How about City of Demons today? Uh, honestly, not just today, but this entire month. Anyhow, today we have another very special show for you today on a night that I normally would not be on. But as you all know, whether it be in the middle of the day, evening, or even in the middle of the night, I will accommodate my guests at any day, any time of the week. Anyway, it's only a one-hour special today, not a two-hour usual sh interview. And, of course, we will be taking your questions in the chat. All I ask is that you please give me at least 15, 20 minutes to get some of my own questions in before I start paying attention to the questions in the chat. And also, do remember, please put your questions in caps. I know most of you will know that and see that already, but nonetheless... Um, let me introduce my guest. So, like I said, if you've been paying attention, obviously you see the title out here. Uh, we have two stars from the Holzer Files, which actually has something to do with Hans Holzer. I'm going to let uh, my guests talk about him when I bring them on. So first, let me introduce to you Dave Schrader, also known as Darkness Dave. He has been, he's obviously in this show and has been on other television shows as well. He's also a radio host, an author, and so much more. Dave it's finally a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to come on and talk today. Oh, oh, I appreciate you giving me the time. So thank you so much. And thank you for bringing your co-host, the one and only psychic medium, Cindy Keza. Cindy, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, let's go back in time and in a brief summary, I'm going to ask both of you, how did you get started into the paranormal? Well, with me, uh, and this is Dave, just so you could tell the difference. Yeah. In voice. <laughs> yeah. People say we sound very much alike. Um, I've just always had it around me in my life, uh, you know, from seeing my grandmother's spirit after she passed away when I was very young to living in a haunted house. And then that really kind of inspired me to look into this uh, from a very early age. And uh, I, I've just always been surrounded by the supernatural. What about you, Cindy? Yeah, you know, well, I mean, I've had this ability since I was uh, a child, but I, I didn't understand it, really. So, you know, having experiences and totally understanding them are two different things. So it really wasn't until, you know, my 20s that I fully embraced what was happening. Um, and, you know, paranormal is actually, like, going to haunted locations is actually something pretty new to me because I've spent the majority of my career... Um, you know, doing readings for people, bringing through their, their loved ones who have passed away and all that stuff. So working on Holzer Files has been just this amazing opportunity for me to go uh, to some amazing places and, and utilize, like, all of these things I've been studying, like automatic writing, psychometry, remote viewing, graph. So it's just kind of one of those shows where I get to ask. Now, Cindy, it was at least Training. 10 yeah. years, right, for you, because I believe you had your first experience when you were 10, but you didn't have your awakening until you were 20 or mid-20s, or well, how long apart was it? Yeah, so my first experience I can remember having was at age 10. Um, the first mentor that I had was at age 19. Her name was Bonnie, and... Um, you know, she started, you know, she, she recognized in me what was going on, the things that I didn't understand. And then, you know, it was around 24 that I, 25, that I just really was like, oh, no, like, this is not going away. I have to accept this. And then from there forward, it, the journey really began, you know, and I started taking it seriously and, and realizing that I needed to, to figure it out. So, Dave, let me ask you this. Uh, approximately how long, I'm assuming you were hunting on your own, right? Or did you form a team and just start doing your own amateur hunting on your own time in between, you know, after work or things like that? Or how, how did that go before you actually got well, when, picked up for TV? Well, when I was a kid, you know, I we'd sneak into some places that were reportedly haunted. Um, you know, but I, I, I never did full investigations until we started the radio show, Darkness Radio, back in 2006. Uh, so we're about to enter our 15th year on the air. And that, that year, um, I said to my co-host, Tim, I said, you know, uh, what if we arrange an event around the Ghost Hunters? Because I'd become good friends with, with Grant and Jason at the time. And I reached out to them after watching their special um, and said, what do you guys think about doing an event at the 
you know, out in Rhode Island near you. We'll get a hotel. We'll meet the, meet the team. Maybe visit your your home office. And they were all for it. And that started it. And then we started investigating the hotel we were staying in because it was haunted. So I really kind of officially started back in 2006. But it's been a part of uh, my fascination my whole life. I've been creeping around in scary places since I was a kid, looking for. Uh, I don't know, just an experience, just to give you that thrill. It's like a roller coaster ride, you know, to, to kind of awaken that part of you. So that's that's pretty much, you know, the official journey launched in 2006, but the the lifelong experiences have always been a part of my, my world. I have a shout-out I just want to make for a super chat in my chat room. Uh, Pyramid7, thank you for your kind comments, and, of course, thank you for the super chat. Uh, now, how did the both of you hook up for this television show, Holes or Files? Well, we met on a swingers website. and uh, no. <laughs> it, oh, okay. <laughs> That's what I, my mind don't, went to. Don't, don't air our dirty laundry, Dave. <laughs> Here, here was the deal. Um, Holzer Files had already hired Cindy, and I remember clearly they reached out to me. They're like, hey, we know you have some affiliation with the Holzer family because I had been the last to interview Hans Holzer. I was friends with Alexandra. She had started my the fan daughter. page. On Alexandra, Facebook. the daughter, right? Right, yeah. So they, they kind of said, well, would you, would you be interested? And at first, you know, when they approached me, do you want to do a ghost show? I'm like, I don't think so. Oh, well, we were looking at going in the direction of following Hans Holzer's footsteps. Then all of a sudden, my interest got piqued. And then they said, we want you to do a little video FaceTime with uh, the medium we're going to work with, Cindy Keza. And I knew who Cindy was. I just had never really worked with her. So we got a chance to do this, and we clicked and found out our birth. We share the same birthday. Can you believe it? We're both 22. Um, <laughs> we were both born on November yeah. 22nd. And uh, ah. although uh, I'm quite a bit older, we, you know, it was just a nice little connection. And so the first two people that they hired for the show share the same birthday. And uh, from there, it was just, you know, um, our, we got along well. They found uh, Shane, who I knew, but again, had never worked with. And they just rounded out the, the team that way. What a coincidence because my birthday is eight days later, so we're all literally in that uh, eight days. Uh, now, you are Scorpios. I happen to be a Sagittarius, but you're on the cusp, so I guess you're Yeah, that's you right. Know. We're on the cusp. I'm a Sagittarius. I consider myself a Sagittarius. I consider oh. myself a Corpitarius or a Sagicorpio, whichever one works better. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll take them all. Okay. Now, I have to ask you this question. This is kind of going to break rank from what we've been asking because I want to go more into, obviously, uh, you know, Hans Holder, etc. cetera. Uh, there are a couple of questions that I ask of people involved in ghost hunting because I'm a big alien UFO guy, and I would love to get your take on these both. Uh, the first two are kind of relatively easy, so I'm going to ask you, Dave, and then Cindy, and the second one, I'll go vice versa. Okay, Dave, have you ever come across a ghost that happened to be the ghost of a dead extraterrestrial? At this point, I would say no, I have not, that I'm aware of. Um, you know, but we've been in some weird places in my life, uh, and it's also been places that are no known to have had a lot of UFO activity. So without the gift that Cindy has to be able to see these spirits, I can't tell you if it was extraterrestrial in nature or human. But uh, no, at, at this point, I don't believe I've been in contact with an alien spirit, uh, you know, an alien disincarnate spirit, I should say. Now, I do have another person in the chat room I'd like to acknowledge. That is the one and only Mr. Alex Owey. And Alex, thank you so kindly for your super chat and support. Now, Cindy, I'm going to give you the same question as well. Uh, because you're also a psychic medium, not just on a ghost hunt through technology uh, or you know EVP or anything like that, have you ever come across a, con a, a ghost of an extraterrestrial or even felt one? because you have that extra layer of uh, being an empath. You know, uh, as far as encountering one in a, you know, investigation, no. Have I felt the energy of one? Yes. Okay. Now, yes. next question for you both. Have you, uh, again, I'm going to ask you this day first. Have you ever come across a ghost that was speaking either a dead language, like a dead ancient language, or a language that clearly has structure as being a language, but is something you've never heard of, like maybe something so off-worldly it's like doesn't make sense. 
like the Skinwalker Ranch? I I can't say I have, although uh, using a spirit box once at a uh, well-known location, the, the James Gilliland's Isetti oh, Ranch. Yeah, 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 that's right. I, I, uh, right. I, we were sitting there, and I had my spirit box going, and we were getting set up, and all of a sudden, the spirit box said, chair, sit, open skies. And all of us stopped and looked at each other. I'm like, get out of here. And we had that happen, and then while we were all communing with nature and watching the skies and seeing things moving around, we started hearing weird things that didn't sound like language, but it wasn't like horror movie, you know, was none of that coming through either. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Like, like, a weird garbled. Vo- it, it just sounded like voices trying to be heard in the background. Uh, I, I don't know how else to explain it other than that. Like it just wasn't coming through clearly enough, but I can't say I heard uh, a foreign language or dead language. Now it's funny Doing our radio show, Dr. J, you'll appreciate this as you speak to many different guests. We had a guest on our show probably 10 years ago who came on and was a a renowned authority on EVP and paranormal investigating. And he spent the first hour of our show belittling every paranormal TV show. The second hour, he was going to show us what real evidence sounds like. And he really queued up this first piece for us. And it was a piece of audio that he had captured. And he said uh, he heard a message. But he knew there was something wrong, and it was uh, like a, a long dead language. Ooh. And he reversed it, and he got another message. And while I was talking to him, literally within ten seconds, I heard the audio piece. I knew what we were listening to. I asked him for clarification, and I said, um, "I said, are you familiar, Ed, with a software called AVS Media?" And he said, oh, yes, we use that recording software to record our, our EVPs. And I said, um, that, that EVP that you've had linguists listen to that say it's a long dead language, that is actually English. It's a woman speaking English with an English accent, and she's saying AVS Media Demo, because it was an audio watermark on the demo recording software they were using. Was, this, then was swore- this English when it was played backwards? No, it was, well, it was English both ways, but it was an actual watermark, which is uh, if, you, if you use a demo audio, it may be like, uh, you know, Dr. J has created this new audio, and before you buy it, you can test it. Well, every 30 seconds, you'll hear Dr. J audio demo, so that people don't just use the free software and, and never pay for it. Yes. So it was AVS Media demo, and then I flipped it, and played it backwards. You could hear his say, is my baby, save it, which was Whoa. intriguing. Until I had Tim say the words AVS Media Demo, and we reversed it, and you could hear Tim say, is my baby, save it. And do I think it was a long dead language? No, it was English. Uh, so I just that was one of my favorite fun No, no, from, I'm, glad, I'm glad, I'm glad, because that, that fits in, because it's still a, a language. Now, could you, if you were to estimate the time frame, I mean, did she sound like, uh, you know, 20th century or uh, 15th century? If you were just to guess, what would it be, shot in the dark? Well, uh, again, it, it was a contemporary voice. It was a watermark on an audio file, so it was, it was new. It was an English woman just stating the name of the company and that it was a demo version of the audio software. So it was saying AVS Media Demo. So it was, it was English, it was now, and it was part of the software package that they had, had, were trying. So it wasn't a ghost voice. But that was, uh, you know, that was somebody that had brought me a long dead language tape, and it turned out not to be long dead. Although in America, the English people might tell us that English language is long dead here. <laughs> but yeah. uh, that recording was just simply... Um, uh, a watermark on the on the audio Play, file, so. played backwards yeah. talking about maybe I, I already got the hair standing up on my head okay cindy same question for you have you ever come across a ghost or even just heard an evp without seeing anything or feeling anything that spoke a dead language or uh, spoke a language that is just something not from this earth or not from this dimension So I want to actually add a little bit of a different element to this. Um, You know, I have not come across it in a CVP, but I have been around people who 
believe they're channeling what's called light language. I don't know if you've heard of this thing that's going on where, I mean, and, and I've, I've been in a situation where I've seen three people be in sort of a trance and they're all speaking what they consider to be a language from another planet. And what I thought was really fascinating about it is that it, I had no idea what they were saying, but their their sounds, all of the sounds and it were exactly the same coming from all of them and the way that they used it and the intonation. It was really, really interesting. So personally, have I heard an alien talk to me? No, I felt the energy. Um, have I captured an EVP of a long lost language? No, but I have seen something that I can't quite explain happening to people uh, that are living and I don't you know is it something that you may be interested in looking looking into it's called light language it's it's interesting yeah absolutely as a matter of fact after the show I'm going to ask you if you guys can please stick around for a quick moment so I can both thank you off air as I will on air uh, or on the stream should I say and uh, if you could give me that so I could write it down that would be great uh, now the, this is the segue to the uh, next topic, uh, which I want to ask you before we go back to uh, Holzer Files and Hans Holder. Okay, I'm assuming both of you have heard of Skinwalker Ranch and the Stardust Ranch, right? Yes. Okay, now, yes. what is your personal take on that? Because, see, we have ghost activity like that dire wolf, extinct wolf from 10,000 years ago that obviously just disappeared on its own, was not affected by bullets yeah, from a 357 Magnum. Um, even when a 30 9 was fired at it, a chunk of flesh came out, which was like so putrid and old. And I, I know you know this part, Dave, from this was like the very first encounter. But then you have like... Uh, UFO stuff happening. You have structured craft. You have little gray aliens. Then you have these giant, tall, black shadows that start peering in your windows. And then before you know it, they're in your house. Then you also have trickster ghosts, like the wife story, where she came back with a bunch of groceries, unpacked them, left the room, came back, and every single thing was put back in the grocery bag. Uh, the predator creature, where you can't see it. Uh, the blue meanies, which really scare me, which are the blue orbs that seem to get near you and strike that fear nerve in you where you're just really scared. Cattle mutilations, dogs being zapped, and then, of course, people hearing disemboweled voices that are both uh, audible only in their head, but even if a group of people are all hearing it, they all can hear it, which is the crazy part, and yet it's a language that no one can discern. What's your take on both the Skinwalker Ranch and Stardust Ranch and about that last detail about that crazy language? Well, I actually got to go to um, Stardust Ranch. I had them on my radio show long before most people had heard about them, and I was working behind the scenes on Ghost Adventures, and Zach had come to me at the time and said, Dave, try to get me in Skinwalker Ranch, which I had tried to do, but as you know, was impossible. Yeah, yeah. So Bigelow I, I owning said, it and Brandon Frugo right. owning it, that's right. I said, but I do have another location that seems to have uh, interdimensional portals, ghosts, and everything. And I, I played the re episode for him, and he's like, lock it in, let's go. Do you want to join us for this? I'm like, hell yeah, I want to join you. So we went off to Stardust Ranch. And it's one of those places that the claims are so absurd that you think there's no way this is possible. But then again, they're so absurd because of what they are. Portals, creatures coming in and out, interdimensional. So here was what I talked to the guys about. I said, listen, individually, we would investigate any one of these claims. Why would we turn our eye away? Because all of them are happening in one place, like the Skinwalker Ranch. And Zach said, you're right, let's go. So we, we booked it, went out and filmed it, and I saw UFO craft uh, in the sky twice that night. Um, Aaron Goodwin and I witnessed it the first time together before filming even started and threw us for a loop. And then I went up on the mountain across from the Stardust Ranch by myself in an isolation experiment where I truly was alone and uh, even turned over my, my walkie-talkie and my cell phone because I believed if the aliens knew I was there and could call for help, why would they make themselves known? So... I was there. Now, I, I could definitely hear something walking around out there on the mountain with me because you could hear the footsteps. They even caught them on a recorder. Um, 
because they had a, a night vision camera placed on the mountain watching me. You could hear the footsteps, but we couldn't see anything. So that was very predator like in nature um, that you could hear it, but not see it. So I've been there. I've not been to Skinwalker, but I've spoken to people that have been to Skinwalker and some of the adjoining properties. I mean, here's the deal. Why, why wouldn't there be pockets where maybe uh, the geo, you know, geographical areas are ripe for it? You've got water, quartz, limestone, whatever might be just really prompting it. And Cindy and I have seen this on the Holzer files. You, some of these places are just rich environments, and you've got that apesioelectric uh, phenomena of the land that could be creating a perfect portal or doorway in. So I think that's uh, pretty remarkable, and I, you know, it's interesting. I just, it's hard for me to speak of Skinwalker Ranch since I've never been there. Um, I talked to the guys that were part of that Skinwalker Ranch special, and I, I think that they were blown away by what they were actually finding and the things that were coming through. So I believe their experiences were very real to them, and I would love the opportunity and hope at some point in my uh, career I'll get a chance to visit Skinwalker Ranch as well. You know, you literally took the next question out of my uh, mind, which is so cool because I'll get to that after I ask uh, Cindy. And even though you haven't been to Sky Skinwalker, but you've been to Stardust, they're so freaking related. Uh, you know, it, uh, to me, you visited at least one. That's more than I've done. Uh, so that, that just freaks me out. And real quick about the Stardust Ranch. What do you think about uh, two details about that? One, the men in black that seem to walk right through the the fence because I, uh, you know, the metal, f the fence, which I've heard that possibly they're just an illusion and they're actually ETs themselves. Also, what do you think about the detail of the man killing uh, one of the ETs, I believe, with the sword, a chunk of skin and some liquid that looked like brake fluid uh, remained. He, you know, bottled it up and sent it to a scientist who was so impressed, said we need to tell the science community about this. And then, boom, he's dead, his lab's blown up, and his wife dies a few days later. Yeah, that, that whole aspect certainly made the case, and, and it's one that you can research for yourself, it made the case a lot more intriguing because you know the one remaining piece um of evidence that was in somebody's hands that could blow this thing up the guy mysteriously dies uh, like you said the explosion and then his wife dies it's really hard to just discount that as just really bad timing but then you see the guy that owns it and he's so eccentric and he's saying the only way to kill these things is by beheading them and he shoved the uh, samurai sword he had threw it so hard through the wall that it actually took that chunk of meat through the wall and it disappeared, but that chunk of meat was remaining, so that's what he sent in. I, again, you hear these stories and they're so unbelievable, but I, you know, I do believe the guy believes that every every part of his story is true and that he has other people that witnessed it um, yes. for and, themselves. That's and where it starts getting really bizarre let's not forget that this same gentleman has actually uh his wife is a former uh she worked for the fbi so they're you know people can't yeah. just dismiss them and say oh these are a bunch of kooks because huh, i don't think that's anything of the case i i'm assuming cindy you've been there or you ha you haven't been there well unfortunately i haven't been to either location um but i really want to go it sounds like a giant amazing lsd trip to me guys <laughs> like yeah. sounds fun but um, but the thing is, um, you know, just feeling into it, it, it feels like there are so many things going on. And I do think that there's an aspect of, of probably elemental spirits there, you know. Um, and I think there's something probably with the, the, the geography, the land. Um, I think it's all possible. But it's hard for me to say until I'm there. Because the other thing that can happen is, you know, people have experiences and then they talk about their experiences a lot. Or stories, you know, get told. And then the stories create create their own psychic imprint. So as a psychic medium going onto land or going onto a property, I have to be able to discern between, uh, you know, what's a psychic imprint, what is actually there, right? There, there's so many elements to it. And even uh, at a location this season in Holder Files, Dave, the one that we were in the, in Ohio, um, where I walked into a location and I was getting all this crazy stuff. I'm like, gosh, I can't believe so many horrible things happened in one place because I was seeing all the psychic imprinting of all the stories that have been told about the place. So there, there are a lot of different aspects of, of, you know, a location that, you know, as a psychic medium, I have to really kind of be there to feel into it. But I would love to go. It sounds exciting. 
Uh, now, Dave, you mentioned exactly, like I said, exactly what I wanted to ask you. It, those two places are really close to each other, and not to mention also very close to where Travis Walton was taking. <clears throat> We right. also know that we have the Bermuda Triangle, which has had, I think, till as long as we've had recorded history in this part of the world, uh, where things disappeared. We're not just talking about World War II era with the uh, five planes and then the chase planes or the, the uh, rescue team after that all disappearing. We're talking, you know, even from the captain, uh, not Captain Crook here. I'm talking about, or Hook here. I'm talking about literally from, uh, you know, Caribbean, 1700s or 1600s, even pirates. But uh, right across the world from the same area, we have the Devil's Triangle. And so, like you said, w you know, I would think we there are several other places on this planet that have the same thing. Uh, for instance, Texas, I think of that, you know, where the Mafia lights are. And you know, is it ley lines, as you mentioned? Is it other anomalies that could be there? So, again, I, I know you gave an explanation as to uh, why wouldn't there be other areas that have some sort of energy that's coming out from there. But do you know of any other places, stay in just in the United States, uh, on land, that have pretty much the same thing where you have every paranormal thing linked bigfoot aliens you know ufos uh ghosts apparitions and all of the above well the bridgewater triangle out east is pretty popular um you know there's a bunch of places that kind of uh have these areas that are ripe with different stories i mean obviously uh, dr hans holzer spent a lot of his time on the east coast so mm -hmm. cindy and i uh, and Shane have spent a, a lion's share of our time on the East Coast. And when you look at the bloodshed, the tragedy, the uh, the psychic and physical scarring of the land, that would be your, um, you know, that that would be like a perfect mix of creating something there that could open it up to other aspects of the paranormal. Plus, on the East Coast, there's been a lot of UFO sightings. There's a lot of cryptid sightings. So... I don't know if, if there's any specific places that are more hot than others, and I think it, it kind of just depends on, on the time of what's going on. I will tell you this, though, before we roll off of the UFO stuff, the government has come clean in 2020 and admitted that they have an active investigation on UFOs, that the footage that they released three years ago is real. There are people from different sects of the military, NASA, and uh, former uh, pilots uh, and, and uh, um, astronauts that have come forward saying we are not alone. So I, I think that part of the discussion is over. Now it's how do we, the people, ready ourselves for the next step, which is obviously going to be um, disclosure, full disclosure. And I, I really believe that that is coming very quickly, uh, especially with some of the insights I've been given recently from um, a, a few people that wish to remain nameless uh, that I, I have very uh, a lot of respect for and I believe in. But I think that in the next year or two, things are going to be blown out of the water and we're going to finally have some solid answers uh, on if we're being visited, how long we've been visited and who it is we're dealing with. Yeah, because... You know, you Dave, know... I, I just... Go ahead. Cindy. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to add something. I think it's, it's pretty interesting, right? Like a, a whole truth bomb about aliens being real from the government happens at a time where hardly anybody can focus on it, right? I mean, it's kind of breaking news, but nobody talks about everything else that's going on. So I find that, that part of it interesting. Right. Right. Kind of sneaking it in. Part of me feels that after you had the 2017 announcement, thanks to, to the Stars Academy for getting it out sooner, uh, fortunately, I don't know if it would have ever been released like they released the full files or, you know, the few months ago. The point being is, to me, that was disclosure. That was as close to disclosure as you're going to get. In 47, you have Roswell, and immediately it's a freaking weather balloon. And I always make the joke of, like, how can the only nuclear uh, base in the entire world with the top engine in, uh, intelligence intelligence officer uh, really screw up uh, a flying saucer for a weather right. balloon. I just It blows my mind how stupid the explanation can be. But I, I don't think well, people... And remember, Dr. J, it wasn't originally blown up as a weather balloon. No, no, this was day the two. The official word yeah. was that there was a crashed saucer. That, that was the official word from the government. And then they went into fixed mode. Yes, so day two. I, uh, from my yeah. understanding, 2017... 
there was something released from the government uh, internally saying it's time to start getting information out there. Uh, listen, as we get closer to the end of the year, I notice that there are things like um, influencers. Uh, and, and it may be hard for a lot of people. You roll your eyes oh, when you hear Demi you Lovato. Like Demi Thyroid. Lovato. I just heard that right. story today. Uh, and, you know, because a friend... A, a, Third phase of moon, um, you know, know a lot of people, the world's largest UFO YouTube channel. And they relayed that story for me. And I, I'm blown away because this opens the door to if influencers are saying something, the followers are all of a sudden going to say, hey, maybe I can tell my story. So, Dave, I'm so glad you brought that up because to me, that's well, And in one news. week, you had Khloe Kardashian, Demi Ooh. Lovato, and Miley Cyrus all come out and not just state it, most, I think... All three have footage that you can find online of some of their experiences, except for Miley. She does admit she can't be 100% certain because she was doing weed wax at the time. Ah, yeah. um, but she, uh, she's open about it. Um, I mean, you have, I don't know, Cindy, this is pretty cool to me. I didn't know if you knew this, but the, the um, lights that were seen in the sky over Arizona, and for some reason the actual name of the sighting is, is uh, the Phoenix Lights. That 1997, sighting, March, yeah. The first person to report it, who was in the sky, seeing it as it unfolded, was actor Kurt Russell. And he remained anonymous oh, wow. for a long time, but he was the first to see this and be an eyewitness. So, you know, there's, it, when you start hearing that these influencers, who a lot of people will roll their eyes at, but now you're, you're having the young generation being broken into it slowly by the people they like and look up to, I, I do feel, uh, Dr. J, that they are opening up a, a pathway to make communication a little... Um, a little bit more acceptable to the masses. Yeah, that too. And there just seems to be a sheer increase in the amount of sightings. And we all know if they want it to stay hidden, they can. Uh, let me also give another shout out in the chat room to my dear friend Rockstar. Thank you as well for your super chat and your support. Uh, now, speaking of what we talked about UFOs and obviously where it's going to. And I'm really excited that you have those contacts that are telling you in the next year uh, or two because I, I think this is the right time. You have a Gallup poll recently said 67% of Earth believes we are not alone. Obviously, that's not the same poll with regards to people who've been we've already visited. But find me someone who's under 21 that tells you they don't believe in UFOs. I, I can barely find any if there are any left. So that's my take on that. Now, let me go back to Hans uh, uh, real quick uh, for a couple moments. And then I'll start taking some of the questions in the chat because I see there are a couple. Uh, Dave, when did you interview Hans Holzer? And uh, I'm assuming prior to you interviewing him, he was a great inspiration to you as being the father. Uh, is he the father of parapsychology and ghost hunting? Or is he just one of the pioneers who picked it up from uh, people prior to him? Well, I mean, everybody gets a title. It's kind of like Las Vegas. Every place you go is voted the number one best buffet or number one best comedian show or magic show. It just depends on the eye of the beholder. But he certainly was... Uh, he's, he's considered kind of the, the father of the modern movement of paranormal in the United States, um, the American ghost hunter, which is interesting since he's from Austria. But uh, he, you know, he, he really steeped his life into it. And this season, we get to investigate his very first case. We get to reinvestigate that case. And uh, Dr. Holzer uh, investigated in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And even into the 2000s, he was still consulting and talking to people about issues they were having, although he was not as active. He died, I believe, at the age of 89. So um, we had spoken to him just uh, a year or so prior to his death. We were his final radio interview, and I had both he, uh, him and his daughter Alexandra on the show. She, her book and his last book came out at the same time, so we interviewed Alex for the first hour and Dr. Holzer for the second hour of the program. Um, and you know, that was released back in, I think it was, I want to say 2006, 2007 in, in one of those first two years after 15 years, they all kind of bleed together of when it, when it took place. But, um, it was, it was remarkable. And I had read a lot of his books growing up. My, my mom and aunt always had Holzer books laying around, uh, you know, because they were fascinating and he had so many that had collections. They were good bathroom readers as my mom would call them because uh -huh. if you go in read a quick story while you were in the restroom and, and uh, you know, pick it up and start off on a whole new story the next time you visited. So, I, you know, 
that was kind of my introduction to Dr. Holzer. Plus, I used to love to watch In Search Of. And Dr. Holzer wrote, produced, and directed all of his own segments, I believe it was, when he appeared on In Search Of. And one of the cases that he covered there, the Mystery Hill case, uh, which is now known as America's Stonehenge, Cindy, Shane, and I get a chance to visit America's Stonehenge. And we have some very special guests joining us on that episode that I'm very excited about. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of really interesting to come full circle to get a chance to have read these stories and now were injected into the history. And what really continues to blow me away about doing these cases, Cindy was not really familiar with Dr. Holzer. She knew of him, but was not an avid reader or follower of his stuff. Um, and watching her go in blind, which is what Dr. Holzer insisted on uh, with his mediums, there are times we will go to do an investigation in Maryland and land in you know uh, New York uh, or New Jersey or or some other state, and Cindy has no clue where we're off to. And then we drive two to three hours, we get to the location, she stays in a hotel without knowing why we're there, and then she doesn't get to see it until she walks literally in for that baseline investigation. And the things, her, her abilities and skills allow her to see, do, and pull from these locations is astounding. And this, this year she's off the hook with what she comes up with. She does automatic writing. She taps in um, with her abilities. She even introduces uh, some spirit drawing this season that's really freaky and remarkable. Um, so it's, it's going to be great to see her uh, really kind of fully developed and in her element this season. We get a chance to really see much more of, of her capabilities and what she is able to do and how eerily accurate she is. I, I just wish that Hans Holzer would have been able to actually work with Cindy on a few of these cases because I think it would have blown him away. There, there comes the next question that you kind of uh, you know, alluded to from my mind, which is, uh, have either of you ever come across the ghost of Hans Holzer? And sin specifically, Cindy, have you ever felt his presence uh, whenever visiting one of the properties or areas that he himself uh, you know, investigated decades ago? You know, interesting. Um, I, I haven't felt Hans, but I have felt uh, Sybil before. So Sybil and Ethel, I've, I've felt the presence of the medium. There was an episode last season that we did in Metuchen, New Jersey. Dave, do you remember which was medium was that? Was episode that? I one I, when you went to the house of some lady who was related to two people that had to do with that home? And I believe one of the, the people you said. No, was, that okay. was our season finale uh, episode. It was our, our first episode, she uh, it was a homeowner in Metuchen. Yeah, and that's the one I'm thinking it, of, episode one. It was a one. cavern. It was everything, the Native American um, hanging ground, unfortunately. And there was a lot of twisted bits. But, yeah, Cindy was, in a sense, remote viewing. Ooh. And we believe, um, I think it's fair to say, right, Cindy? We kind of believe that Ethel, his, uh, his medium, was almost sending messages through from her time to us because... As we're listening to those recordings, she's tapping in to what we were seeing in the room at that time 50 years later. Wow. Yeah, I, no, I felt Ethel and... Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's for you. Yeah, but I felt Ethel and Sybil um, a few times during the course of filming last season and this season. And to me, that's actually really cool because uh, it's, it's almost like they're coming back to help finish or, or continue cases that they were a part of. And I think that that's fun, you know, and, and in that particular case in Metuchen, um, I was being helped, you know, by, by the medium because, you know, they, they also want the case to go forward. They want the pieces to be seen too and known. And also like, we're all picking up on the similar things. And that's one of the most exciting parts of the show for me is that I get to go in blind and then Dave gets to tell me, this is exactly what Ethel was picking up on. This is exactly what Sybil was picking up on. And to me, that's something really special because two mediums going into a location, even if it's 50 or 60 years apart, right, should be getting the same information. The difference now is that I'm going in all these years later and picking up on, you know, maybe things that have happened since or continuing the story. So it's just a really special show to be a part of 
for a medium. The other thing that's really, really great is that Hans Holzer loved mediums, right? I mean, the paranormal world and the mediumship world nowadays, although you would think that they would be very much uh, together, they're actually, they're actually separate. So a lot of my uh, colleagues that are mediums don't do paranormal, right? And so the fact that I get to be a part of a show where, you know, I know that it's grounded in, in mediumship, and I know that all of the files have mediums, evidence for mediums. It's really, really cool. Uh, now, have either of you been harmed uh, in any of your investigations or hunts? Uh, har harmed by the ghosts or any spirit in the house? Well, uh, for people that watch season one of the Holzer Files, our very first episode that uh, we filmed together was at uh, the Whaley House in San Diego. And Ooh, this I is our first time. I, wait a minute. I didn't know that's in my own backyard because <laughs> I just re yeah. I watched that just a couple hours ago to refresh myself on season one. And so I decided on episode one. That house is in Southern California. I'm yeah, the Whaley House is in Southern California. And uh, I got knocked to my butt, uh, if you well, knocked to my knees. Actually, if you watch that episode, we were calling on the spirit that has been kind of a dark presence there even before the Whaley's owned that home. And we were challenging it. Uh, I was challenging it. And we asked if, if this spirit had a hand in the death of Violet Whaley, who had committed suicide. And to our astonishment, it sounded like a shotgun went off inside the house. She had killed herself with a shotgun. Um, and her body was then carried in from outside into the house where she passed away. So we were standing right next to where she died. We were standing under the archway of where some people had been hung on site. And we were really getting this just crazy activity. And this angry spirit had told Cindy the, the night before that he was going to shut down our cameras. And two minutes later, he did. Uh, the spirit told Cindy he was, didn't like me and was going to knock me out, take, take my knees out. And, uh, you know, within five minutes, I get violently shoved into uh, uh, Shane and I hit the ground landed on my knees and turned around and, and I was shocked. I, I walked out of the house. They continued the investigation for a little bit. I needed to clear my head, but uh, I had that happen. And then uh, when we were on the USS uh, Constellation out in Baltimore, um, again, I was, we, we were investigating and all three of us were stationed on different parts of the ship. And uh, we, I was hearing footsteps above me and I was following around a shadow that looked like a kid. As soon as I stopped paying attention to the kid and started paying attention to the, the footsteps and Cindy came up, something bit me on the forearm. Whew. And when I rolled up my shirt, you could see this little mouth print on my arm. Um, and it bit hard. Like my arm was the mouth just, print, the size of a kid, an adult. Uh, what would you say? To me, it looked like a kid's bite. Having been the father of uh, eight children and having had my fair share of bites, it looked like uh, a kid's bite on my arm, um, and it hurt like hell. So those two times, but again, I, we don't believe these things were demonic. We just think that they're pissed off ghosts that demand attention. And sometimes when you're ignoring these things or, or missing the point of their story, they act out. And uh, we take it very seriously. You know, with the, the Whaley House, um, we offered to have it cleared and bring in an Indian uh, Native American shaman to do a clearing. And they declined at the time, but they said if things get crazy that they will call us back in and would like us to reinvestigate and, and see if we could bring in help. So if that ever happens, we'd be happy to return. Uh, Cindy, same question to you. Have you ever been harmed, touched, uh, you know, felt nauseous, anything of the sort like the examples Dave just gave? Well, I've never been pushed like Dave or physically harmed. Uh, have I felt nauseous? Absolutely dizzy. Yes, uh, energetically drained, 100%. And, you know, there are times when I leave an investigation and I know, like, something's with me still from this investigation. So I'm really mindful that all those things are possible and they do happen. So I, I really make sure that I, you know, do cleansings and stuff like that because, uh, as a medium or even as anybody going into an investigation, you know, energy can, can attach itself to you, you know, you can bring things home with you and it does happen. So, you know, those things have happened, but luckily, um, have not been physically harmed. I hope it doesn't happen. Um, and I am very cautious. Now I'm going to take some questions in the chat for the next, uh, 15 or almost 15 minutes. Now, anybody, I'm going to, 
do my best. I think I'm going back to the, the oldest one. If that isn't the oldest one, if uh, the person who's prior to that or any people that are, it's plural prior to that, please copy and paste your question at the bottom and I will do my best to get to them all. Now, Dave and Cindy, these are for both of you, unless one, of course, is uh, directed at you. The first one, Lasha Senyuk, have they ever gone to Gundy Womp, Connecticut? That would be worth checking out, guys, is what she says. No. Okay. Nope. No. Nope. Haven't been. Next one. Alex Owen. After a person passes, are they stuck earthbound for a period of time and have they used or heard of necrophic app? Uh, do you want me to take this, Dave? Yeah, please. Okay. Okay. So here, here's my take on, you know, we use the term earthbound spirit a lot. Uh, a lot of mediums use that term. To me, energetically, it doesn't make sense for a spirit to be, you know, completely trapped in the third dimension because when, the, when somebody passes away, their soul, it, it, it vibrates differently. It goes to the other side. Now, having said that, I do believe there are spirits who have unfinished business, who are very, very attached to earthly things, who are very, very close, very impressed upon this layer, the third dimension. And those are the spirits who have a very hard time, um, you know, understanding that they don't have to be so attached to earth that they can move to the next layer level whatever you want to call it um do i think every spirit has that experience at the time of death no not necessarily uh i do believe you know there's a period of, of a life review all that stuff i believe um but i don't think that every spirit is earthbound quote unquote for for a period of time i think it depends on the soul right Mm -hmm. um to, to answer the, the back half of that question i i have not heard of that can you repeat the phrase to me what was it sure it, it's an app and it's called necro necrophonic like necrophonic no, as in p-h-o-n-i-c -P like a uh, phone i guess yeah neither have ne i actually necrophonic sounds like an 80s uh 80s Song? synth band. <laughs> That's true. That's right. Okay. Yeah. This next one is aimed at you, Cindy. Cindy, when you see beings from another realm, do they see you as well? If so, how do they act and react to you? Yeah, that, that's a really that's a really interesting question. So um, do I think that they always see me? I'm not sure. I feel like there are some that are caught in a loop, but Having said that, right, I'm kind of mindful. Are they really in a loop or am I seeing a psychic imprint or just a memory of something that happened over and over again? Uh, most of the time, I do think that they're aware of me because they're trying to communicate with me. And a, a, a giant misconception about how mediumship works is that, you know, people think that the medium sees the spirit like I'm looking at, I'll be looking at you in the living and that we're having this dialogue like I'm having with you now and, and that's not how it happens. It's, it's kind of like playing Pictionary Charades and Telephone all at the same time. So I can feel the presence of spirit. Then they might show me an image of how they pass. Then I might hear a name and then I might, you know, feel th their emotions. So it, it's, I have to be completely present to experience all these different things, and then I have to figure out what, what they're trying to show me. And so, you know, when you see me working in the holder files, sometimes it, it takes me a second to say, I'm not, I don't quite understand, and then I, I have to go back and kind of feel into it. But most of the time, I do think that they're aware of, of me, because if they weren't, they wouldn't be trying to communicate their message. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's where I stand on that. The next one is for you, Dave. Dave, have you ever felt really threatened at a ghost hunt? If so, what happened? Uh, you know, I kind of mentioned that my attack at, at the Whaley House. Um, I, I, I can't say I've felt threatened. I've felt really uncomfortable from time to time. Uh, our show and our team, we are not quick to jump to the demonic as, a, as an explanation. Um, we think that a lot of times it's just misunderstood or energy. And you got to realize some of these spirits have been knocking around possibly for a hundred plus years. And finally somebody is there listening to them and how frustrating it might be if they're unable to make full communication. So we try to take that in mind. Um, have I felt threatened? I don't think threatened is the right word. Um, I feel like I've been, uh, uh uncomfortable i feel like i've been overwhelmed by the energy that's taking place uh sometimes i feel like i just am not wanted there but i you know i don't think i've ever been in a place unless you can remember the season cindy was there a time that i was just like oh, i'm getting out of here something feels like it's gonna kill me there are 
sometimes at times where, where things are happening, but I never saw you like run out of a location, you know? Um, I mean, I was the Whaley house was, was the one where I think you were most affected, but, um, you know, other than that, I, I think, yeah. Well, I get a couple of jump stairs in on me this season, Dr. J, uh, in season two, a couple times things happen that frighten the hell out of me at the moment. But again, it's, you know, I'm human. You see something in the dark moving towards you. And, and uh, it, I can tell you this, one, one occasion something scared me so bad that it left an indelible mark on me. Uh, and my whole team was worried I was seriously injured. So you'll have Ooh. to tune in and find out about that later on in the season. But there were a couple of moments this season where I certainly, <laughs> I was shocked and, and frightened at the second. But, uh, you know, you, you got to just put your head down and keep doing That's what Dr. Holzer did. He was... He, he Un- listened undeterred. to these recordings. He was undeterred. Yeah. He lis- you listen to these recordings, and some of them are terrifying as this medium is channeling these threats or, or screaming. Dr. Holzer remains calm throughout and talks the spirit down and tries to get to the bottom of it. And, you know, sometimes I feel like a goof because, um, you know, I Kool Aid man it through a wall in one episode this season because uh, I got so freaked out and I tried to back up and fell through a. a, a a wall so you get those moments up like oh dr holzer's got to be shaking his head at me but you know um we're also putting ourselves in a position he didn't he wasn't like he kicked around in the dark as much uh and i don't know if he would have been down in that basement and seen what i saw if he wouldn't have (laughs) reacted the same way um he was very calm when dealing with the medium because he trusted his medium like we trust cindy when i'm around cindy we feel a lot more trust with what she's telling us and, and how to deal with what we're, we're going up against. You know, we get unnerved mostly when we're separated, and that's sometimes when the magic happens. Sometimes that's what the spirits are looking for, to communicate with us in the ways that they want to be seen, hurt, or felt. And, you know, this season, I, I feel 100% confident in saying we captured some of the best paranormal evidence I've ever seen on a TV show or movie ever. Well, I can't wait for it to premiere, which is uh, the 29th, right? Right, October 29th, we're on, and we're on a little later this time, only on the first episode. Um, We're usually on 9 p.m. Central, uh, that's 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific, Um, but this time we're going to be a little later because we're following the Ghost Adventures special two-hour Halloween episode at Joe Exotic Zoo. So oh, that's, yes, uh, yes. that's going to be on that we're going to follow with our premiere episode, The Phantom Hand, which is an amazing story. Uh, and your listeners and followers are going to love it. It's one of the most well-documented and strange cases that this family was being tormented by a spirit in their home. And from time to time, the trap door on the floor would open and they would see this hand coming out. It got so bad they called the cops. And this is an official report in the newspapers of the time. The police went in and opened fire on this thing and then refused to go down in the basement they knew that whatever was down there was not human and they just their you know basically advice was just get the hell out of there if you don't like what you're dealing with um and then there were more stories coming up from around the area so this this episode kind of tackles um the possibility of a mass murderer it tackles the possibility of a very large swath of land haunted as opposed to one or two little locations and we really kind of dive in deep in that season uh, premiere so it's going to be a good one um and something you know if i can mention uh dr j my radio show darkness radio we have brand new paranormal episodes every wednesday and thursday we're on stitcher we're on podbean we're on spotify whatever smart device you have just tell it you know uh, google Play Darkness Radio's newest episode, and whatever you've got will launch the newest episode for you. Um, So that's out and available. We also have this coming Monday on Travel Channel, there's a shock doc called This is Halloween, where they sat down and interviewed all of the different stars of the paranormal TV shows on Travel Channel, talking about our favorite and scariest moments for Halloween. And I know that Cindy, Shane, and I are on that episode as well. Uh, But Cindy's got a couple of really cool things going on. Um, and she's, uh, she's making herself available to her audience in new ways with the new world that we're in. Cindy, why don't you tell them what you're doing and yeah, how people... Yeah, please, please do that, exactly what Dave said, and also, can you also tie in uh, some of your automatic writing of what you've uncovered that we're about to see in Season 2? Yeah, sure. So, uh, and also, Dr. Dave, I wanted to add something in with, with 
for the question of are spirits aware of me all of the time? You know, it just, as I was listening today, something came to me um, where, you know, there there are times where I will see uh, spirits and I, I kind of call it like they're in the mist, which is in this place where they're a little bit lost. In, in those moments, they usually can't see me, which is interesting. So it kind of, it came to me after I had to think about it for a second. Um, but, uh, automatic writing, yeah, you know, um, I use automatic writing a lot this season. I used it a lot last season, too, but what I love about automatic writing is that it, it's like channeled writing. Well, it is channeled writing. I think Cindy. Yeah, I was just car. gonna say uh, yeah, for her being in the, car, in the car, she. So we're losing some of her connectivity I right now. I think so, Cindy. Do we get the rest of you? Well, maybe Dave, you could tell us where people can find her. Yep. Yeah, if you follow her on um, on the uh, uh, Facebook, Medium Cindy Kaza, she does some uh, gallery, live gallery sessions. She also does some teaching on psychic development. Uh, and such, and you can sign up. She usually does one or two of these a month, but they sell out quickly. She also uh, has her websites and such where you can follow her and be able to get readings and keep in touch with Cindy. So, um, hey guys, are- sorry. Oh, there you are, Cindy. I was just telling them how yeah. they can find you. Yeah, that's exactly. So he, I, he beat you to it, Cindy. But go ahead. If you have anything else you would like to throw into the events that you're doing, um, go. Floor is yours. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, because I usually tour the U.S. doing live mediumship events. I've been doing that for about seven years, but with COVID, that obviously can't happen. So I've moved all of my live events on Zoom, and it and it's working. So if anybody's interested in coming to see me do mediumship uh, live, it will be on Zoom. I post all of my events on my Facebook page, Medium Cindy Kaza. You can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all under Medium Cindy Kaza. Um, but yeah, it's it's I hope everybody is, you know, safe out there and, and staying home and everybody stays healthy because um, it is a it's a crazy time. You know? Yeah, to say the least. Um, now, again, like I said, please hang by afterwards so I can thank you again off air. I, I'll take this one final question towards you because I think it's a brilliant uh, final thing you could say. This is from Lasha again. If you could tell a spirit one thing and they would completely hear you and listen, what would you want to say to them? Personally, oh, I would gosh. like to say you're not forgotten, which I think is a big part of what we do on the Holzer Files, is helping to let these spirits' voices and stories be told the right way, perhaps for the first time since they died. We peel back the legends, the lore, and the nonsense, and we, we try to tell the real story. So I just want these spirits to feel at peace that they won't be forgotten and that their stories will not go untold. I, we, yeah, we, the, go ahead, oh. Cindy. I want to hear yours. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, you know, not to sound kind of cheesy, but but I would tell the spirit, you know, you are loved. Because in my experience as a medium, when I've got spirits coming back wanting to make amends to their loved ones, I see this all the time when they pass away from suicide or drug overdose or, or many different ways or they just never got to, to tell somebody I'm sorry. It, it, a lot of the times they just want to know that they're loved and that they're forgiven. And, and that's really like forgiveness, I think, is one of the most healing things. Um, and one of the hardest lessons uh, of being a human is to truly know how to forgive. So that that's my take on it. And, and again, like you both said, uh, or Dave, I think you started to say this, is attention. I think just acknowledging that they're there is something they've been, you know, God knows how long been looking for it. I heard an interesting thing on the new release of Unsolved Mysteries in Volume 2. They do an episode in Japan uh, which had to do with the earthquake which caused a tsunami, I believe it was 2011, where you have a lot of ghosts that have shown up and uh, for instance this lady who's had experiences like yourself Cindy where she was literally talking to ghosts and she thought everyone can do what she was a little girl I saw a group of young men that were walking and they were totally confused and she realized they were ghosts because they were a little translucent so she stopped and talked to them and, and asked if she if they, she can help them and their reply is you know we're lost we don't know where we are i we, you know what can you take us home and she had to sadly explain that they were dead so i just thought that'd be interesting to throw in because it comes down to acknowledgement and you know a lot of these spirits are asking for your help such as passing over and i think that's really cool uh which also is what hans did in uh, that same home right uh in season one episode one 
Now, let me throw a couple things out there. Of course, I want to thank my guests, Dave Schrader and, of course, Cindy Kaze. I hope I said that properly, Cindy. I, and You did. Thank you. I do thank yes, uh, I want to thank you for making sure I didn't screw it up and for uh, uh, politely telling me I, I had it right. And also, keep in mind, folks, because I have been banned off Twitter, shadow banned, where all 39,000-plus subscri- followers are gone, and Facebook has also recently shut me down, which is uh, for really nothing other than, um, I guess I not, I, I don't want to say certain words that'll trigger, um, you know, hiding shows. So I'll leave it at that, which kind of restricts me to Instagram. There's a poll I put up there. I would really love all of you to check it out. And if there's anybody out there who knows video editing that would like to volunteer here we are always open for that and i do want to give a shout out to my social media manager pam vrettenberg uh despite these shutdowns she has worked her hardest to um maintain things and uh with that being said i want to thank you all for joining us here today now you know my policy i do not like to talk about future guests because things happen if i told you a couple months ago graham hancock was coming and then that saturday you're all waiting and then something like well, like something went wrong where he couldn't do it, then you'd all be upset. And that time where Corey Good was supposed to be on, and uh, he'd screwed up the time, so we were about to go, and, and then he had to reschedule for a week away. Thankfully, you all heard it, so that's why I'm not going to tell you who's coming this week. All I could say is pay attention to the site. It's a brand new site. I would love all your feedback and uh, you'll see more and more filled in. With that being said, this is Dr. J, host of Dr. J Radio Live with my two wonderful guests, Dave Schrader and Cindy Keza, and we are officially